Recently, the Canadian government stunned the world when it made a decision to sever diplomatic ties with Iran. It closed the embassy, the, Canadian, the Iranian embassy in Ottawa. They closed the Canadian embassy in Tehran. And they were the first in the world to do such a thing. That was before the protests against the film started. In the weeks to come, we'll be looking at the response to this decision from Canadians, from Israelis, from Iranian Canadians. But today, coming up in today's program, is a look at practical parenting, the skills that you can actually teach parents to raise stronger, well-adjusted children, especially important in these fast-changing times, with Stan Shapiro. And later, Aaron Lightstone from the award-winning musical group Jaffa Road. Stan Shapiro, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Practical parenting. Let me read what you wrote in the book. Why practical? Which it is, I don't know any program in the world that is more practical. I've come to realize, you write, that the relationship parents have with their children are more important than any other. Virtually every developmental problem, from bedwetting to attention deficit disorder, can be helped if only parents were taught the skills they need to be effective. The key word here is skills. We hear philosophy, we hear different ways of being a parent, strict, laissez-faire, criticisms, but nobody teaches us how to speak, what to do, how to discipline, specifically step by step. The other thing that you say is parenting, the most important job in the world, doesn't require a diploma. That's right. Doesn't require a license. You have to have a driver's license. You have to have a diploma to be anything. But you have nothing to be a parent. Yeah. So let's well, get back to what, what is is that you actually do. What's the program? Well, I think, first of all, we have to look at that whenever you have a job, you have to learn the job. There are skills for any job in the world and people have to practice these skills, right? Now here is a difficult job. Uh, probably, I would say the parenting is the most difficult job in society. And it's 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day, and it's the most important, right? And here, there is almost no courses at university about parenting. Uh, there's no degrees in parenting. You know, people are extremely courageous to take on the job. What about the people that, the that professionally work with children? What about, uh, are there courses specifically worded to, to be concretely skills for doctors, for pediatricians, Do you for know, teachers? No. It, at the university level, none of the professional people are taught parenting skills. So therefore, when you go to a professional, whether it's a pediatrician or whatever, they very often will say, you know, I don't have that knowledge. So, which is quite surprising because, you know. That's who parents turn uh, that, to. And, and they work with parents all the time. So uh, at the university level, it is not taught. Teachers or any profession, it is not taught. Now, it seems to me the reason that it's not taught is that Parenting is underrated. It's not given the kind of status that it should have. Because in my mind, it is the most important job. Um, uh, Bill Clinton really impressed me. He said that even though I'm the president, he said, my job is second to being a parent. That was really quite impressive. And that's with He's only one great. child. Yes, that's right, and only one child. But the point but is that, it, that's the point. I mean, when you think of, you talk to anybody, they will tell you that my family comes first, my children come first, this job that I have is second. And yet when you ask him, what do you know about parenting? You know, they, how do they know it? From the way they were taught. When you're a child and your parents are parenting you, you either copy it or you go exactly the opposite because you hated the way you were parented. Other than that, where are the skills? So what kind of skills are needed? 
that basically I think I could categorize six major skills that parents have to have, but not only in parenting, but in their relationships with other people. One of the skills you have to have is to be able to listen. When you're relating to somebody, the person wants to feel respected and understood. And you have to know how to listen. It's a listening skill. You also have to know how to talk to someone so that you're respectful to them and that you're uh, getting your ideas across. So how to talk, how to listen, that's a communication skill. And you break it down. You give examples. You practice. You role play. Exactly. It sounds so easy. It sounds easy. But when you really get into the uh, practicing part, it takes quite a while to be okay. What do a good we have listener. to know? What do we have to know to listen better? Is it nonverbal responses? Is it a way of asking questions? It's um, it's. One is eye contact. Uh, another is, uh huh. Nonverbal response. Yeah. It's, you know, when you're talking to someone and they have no response in their face, you don't know if they're even interested in you. But when somebody, just like what you did just now, you went like I'm that. I'm actively involved. With yeah, you. you're actively involved, even though you're not talking. Okay, there's a lot more. So in our next segment, we're going to talk about the skills, specific skills, and the linchpin of your philosophy, which is the family meeting. Practical Parenting with Stan Shapiro. You mentioned that there are six skills, six important points. Mm. The first one is active listening and engaged listening and how to do that. What are the other five? There is um, the use of consequences. Now, a lot of people are very familiar with punishment because that's the way they were raised. Punishment is outdated today. You're not allowed to touch a child to hit. Exactly. In most countries, you touch a child, you could lose your child. They'll be taken away from you. So uh, that method of parenting is out. But the use of consequences is far more effective, and it's a way of teaching children about life. Give us an example. OK. Uh, there are two kinds of consequences. There's natural and logical consequences. Um, if I put my hand on a hot stove, it gets burned. That's a natural consequence. That's a natural consequence. And what we say is don't pamper a child. Allow them to experience consequences. I don't mean touching their hand on the stove, but, but allow them to experience the natural consequences. So for example, child says, uh, I don't want to eat. OK, so what many parents will do is beg the child to eat. They will bribe the child to eat, right? Natural consequences take care of that. Um, uh, one would say to a child, if you don't eat, you'll be hungry. But that's up to you. That's your choice. And you let them go hungry. And you let them go hungry. How many times will they choose to go hungry? When you're hungry, it, it's painful. So this is very respectful of the child. Doesn't want to eat. No force, but if he no does, coercion. Exactly. No forcing. If you start to force and you start to reward the child, which a lot of people do, the child will be expecting it, get a lot of attention from that, get a lot of payoff out of that. So that, that's an easy example of uh, logical and natural into a classroom. Consequence. You said that teachers are taught everything except the most important problem that they face almost every day, which is discipline. Yeah. So how does that work in a classroom? Well, in classroom, for example, consequence. Um, let's say a child is disturbing the group. You know, there the teacher is talking, the child is interrupting, and disturbing the group. Uh, a consequence for that would be that the child cannot remain in the group if they choose to disturb the group. So the uh, teacher might say, "Would you please?" Uh, go to the office 
and come back when you're ready to cooperate. So look, everything, the onus is always on the child. It's never external pressure. That's, That's the point. They have to take responsibility. Yeah. They can or they cannot. It's yeah. up to them. See, when you put external pressure on people, we rebel. No one likes to be uh, uh, bossed around, told what to do. So you have within children a lot of rebellion, not because a child is rebellious, but they're reacting. We would be rebellious if somebody uh, tried to control us as well, right? This is human nature. So in Countries are rebelling right now against dictators. Exactly. Whole That's countries. right, the whole, the whole country. Yeah, the world really is fighting for their rights, their equality, and there is a uh, revolution going on in the world. Um, and this, it's an evolution also in relationships. In the past, uh, there was, uh, for example, men, they were more dominant and they could tell their wife what to do. If the wife didn't obey them, they could smack them and they would be supported by the community because they were superior. This movement, when you're talking about uh, uh, women's movement and so forth, it's the struggle for equality. And even though women have uh, won their equality, so to speak, there's still the issue of equal rights where people are paid, women are paid, for the uh, same work that a man does. So equality, we're still struggling towards that. And this is what's going on in the world, isn't it? That everyone feels, I'm a person, I have rights, and I should be And respected. children feel like that. Little children feel like that. Sure. Now you would think they're a little kid. They wouldn't understand that. Do you know that a little child five years old today will tell their parent, you can't tell me what to do. When I was a kid, if you ever said that to your parent, it would be the end of your life. The movement is away from punitive uh, approach to children. Um, now we want them to express how they feel, what they think. Whoever asked me what I thought when I was a little kid, nobody cared what I thought. But today, in this evolution towards equality, we're very interested in what children think. And you know, parents today treat their children so much nicer and sweeter Maybe they're overdoing than when it. we were kids. Do you think they're overdoing it? It's time to go to bed okay? No, I, I think when you say overdoing it, I think it would be pampering a child, letting them get away with things, you know, uh, being disrespectful to other people. So they're sweet and then they let children be uh, hostile and obtrusive and they let them get away with that. But being nice to someone and respectful, that's not overdoing it, I don't think. We'll be back with the family meeting. We have still a couple more points to cover on the actual skills, but the family meeting is an entirely new concept. Actually, it's Adlerian, isn't it? Yes. Which is the philosophy that you practice. Oh, but you just don't do philosophy. It is practical tips and advice and practice for the parents of how to do this. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Stanley Shapiro, Practical Parenting. The linchpin, the basis of your philosophy, of your approach is the family meeting. Tell us how that works. If people are respectful of one another, we have to talk and come to agreement or consensus. Um, with children, we frequently do not involve them in decision-making and consensus. We tell them what to do. They feel they're being bossed, so they become rebellious. And there's all degrees of rebellion. What will change the family dramatically is if we could establish then a democratic process, which we call the family meeting, 
And we involve the children in uh, routines. We involve them in problem solving. We invite them to participate so that they have input and uh, consensus to whatever is decided. How young, how young can you be for a family meeting? A three-year-old? Yeah, uh, two and a half is probably a good time to start. And the reason is because they understand right from wrong, a two and a half, and they could express themselves. So we would involve them right away. Now, when we have a family meeting, of course, when you have very young children, we wouldn't talk about things that are beyond their comprehension. What would you talk about, for example? Well, with a two and a half year three, old. Three, five, six to ten. Yeah, for example, like a two and a half year old, we would talk about um, going to bed at night, let's say, the routines. So we would talk about um, when we go to bed, what will be the routine. So we have a bath, and then after the bath is a book, and then a kiss, and then the lights are out, and so forth, right? So what, um, when we're talking about that, instead of, for example, telling a child what it is, I like to ask questions. Uh, when we go to bed, uh, what would be the first thing that you'd have to do? And then the child might say, well, we've got to brush my teeth and take a bath. Okay, and then after the bath, how are you going to wipe yourself? Okay, and can step I, by step. Yeah. So um, we're asking questions. The child is responding. I want to watch television. Oh, that's wonderful. We can watch television after supper. I want to watch it after my bath. Okay. Uh, you want to have an earlier bath then, and then television afterwards. And then we'll go to sleep. Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> See, so here you ha you're using um, active listening, you know, the listening skill. And then let's say I don't like the idea. So I might say to the child, you know, I think I would have a problem with that because after the bath, when you're tired, watching t television might not be so good because you might get... Um, excited and so forth, and it's harder to you fall asleep. You give them reasons. You give them reasons, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I might ask, what do you, you know, let's say, when I make a suggestion at a family meeting, I like to ask a child, what do you think about that? See, when you're talking to someone, um, you give an opinion. It's very respectful to ask, what's your thoughts about that? Okay, let's go to fighting in a family. Okay. He always wants my things, and he always uses my room, and he's always there when my friends come. Okay. Now, with fighting, that's one of the biggest problems that families have. And something that realistically fighting. never goes away. That's right. However, people have disagreements. Uh, Husbands and wives have disagreements, so it's not unusual. So through the family meeting, we could talk about what are some of the problems that you're having together? What suggestions do you have to make it better? What suggestions do you have? Yeah. That's the key. Yeah, that's the key. So you're involving them. If they say, for example, I don't know what to do, here, let me make a suggestion, see what you think about that. So always you're involving them in the dialogue. When a person is involved in the dialogue, they feel important. When you feel important, you feel belonging. Everyone in what they do is a movement towards being important in some way. But people want to be constructive. They want to help out. Uh, children... They want to help the family. So through the family meeting, their ideas are helpful to the family. See. Now, in the um, agenda for a family meeting... You, write, you actually write an agenda. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea, but we have some overall ideas about an agenda, starting off with things that are going well. And that's encouraging. And then um, a second would be planning. Uh, the planning is the routine, the rules in the family. So those are the, the parts of the planning. 
Uh, the third would be responsibilities. Uh, we want the children to help. Uh, they're very important in contributing to the family. And especially today where both uh, mother and father are working and they have so much on their plate. And a child really could be helpful. And when you're helpful, you feel important. You feel like you contributed. Uh, children who are pampered a lot and not asked to help, they, they don't feel important then because they're not contributing anything. I mean, when we think about our life and our work, the reason you feel good about your work is because you're contributing something to society, to the group that you're with. So um, that's the third item would be jobs. Stan, you have so much to tell us and I hate to interrupt. Where can people find out more about practical parenting? Well, they could uh, email us at... Uh, Under practical parenting. That's right. And our website is practical parenting. Uh, we also um, uh, call ourselves, we have another book called Parent Talk. And they could look up the website on Parent Talk. And, you know, and, and, there and if you're and, interested in courses, Get in touch with Stan Shapiro through the website. Yes. 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 And we'll but, have you back. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks a lot. Aaron Lightstone, leader of the band, of the award winning band, Jaffa Road, and performer, and Expert on the wood, let's hear a little. As he's playing, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and the group. Recent winners of the John Lennon Songwriting Award, also named Best World Music Artist at the Toronto Independent Music Awards. Their debut album, Sun Place, was nominated for a Juno Award, and this is their latest CD, Where the Light Gets In. And really, it's light. Thank light, you. your music. <laughs> is in a way controversial because it's not just one style, it's many, rolled up into one. It's Hebrew, it's English, it's Ladino. Arabic. Arabic, Indian. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, to, to us playing this music, it's uh, in many ways, it's sort of the natural consequence of being a musician in, in this time and place and being interested in so many different kinds of music living in a place like um, Toronto, where there's so many opportunities to hear and interact with musicians of so many different uh, backgrounds and cultures, visiting a place like uh, Tel Aviv, where there's, a, I think, a real uh, parallel kind of scene, you know, where people have come from all over the world, Jews have come from all over the world, and then you have the indigenous Arab population as well, and the Druze, and everybody's all, everybody's all mixed up. And we can't, as musicians, I mean, we can't help but uh, try this, try that, you know, and, and, as a, and personally, I know I've, I have been involved in a number of different musical s styles. I started out with, with blues, and over, over time, I got very interested in, in the oud and, and sitar. And guitar. And, and guitar along the way, of course. And um, just by virtue of, you know, this time and place that we, that we live in now, the this process of fusion, I think, can become very uh, uh, natural and, and also very accelerated. Just so we know what we're talking yeah. about, let's have a look at Jaffa Road, at some of your performances, and get a sample of what we're really sure. listening to. Max, okay. <laughs>
we'll come back and hear sure. more. But first, there's something unusual, then haunting even about the singer. Tell us about Aviva Chernik, the singer. So Aviva, my, uh, my musical partner and uh, the singer in Jaffa Road, she's a Toronto-based singer. She's a chazanit. She does a lot of work as a cantorial soloist in, the, um, in some of the synagogues around town. Um, she's currently, she wasn't able to join us today because she's in the studio mixing her solo project, which I'm also playing on, and we're very excited about that as well. Uh, it's tentatively called The Prayer Project, and um, she's a wonderful singer and uh, composer and uh, performer, and we're very lucky to have her as a, as a lead singer in, uh, in Jaffa So Road. who exactly have you got in the band, and what are they playing? So I'm playing oud and guitar live and on recordings uh, and, and synthesizer. Oud, guitar, and synthesizer, and on recordings I sometimes add a little bit of saz, the Turkish long neck lute. We've got Jeff Wilson on percussion and drums. We've got Aviva. We've got Sundar Viswanathan on saxophone and bansuri the, and backup vocals. And we have Chris Gartner on bass and he's also the, uh, the producer of the new record. So five people. Five of us. Five, yeah. five of you. Yeah. And then we have some guest artists on the CD such uh, like Yair Dalal, the, the master violinist and oud player from Israel. Yair Dalal. Yeah. He's, uh, he contributed uh, some violin playing to the, to the album. And uh, we cover one of his songs. Um, and he's been a teacher and a friend uh, to us as well. Uh, Amir Amiri is a Persian uh, santor player from from Tehran, who lives in Winnipeg, and Aaron Ben Susan, the, the local Chazan, he sings a, a, a verse of a song in Arabic. Actually, the song that Yair wrote. Aaron Ben Susan is from Morocco. He's from Morocco. He's been living in Toronto for many years now. Yeah, and Michael Rennie, a, a guy who's a wonderful singer, songwriter, and violinist, originally from South Africa. So we had the, the five, the core five, and then we had these four uh, guest artists as well. This is what this is your second CD? It's our second, yeah. The second. Yeah. And the first one won what? What awards did they Well, have? we're very proud of the first one. We got, you know, just our first CD and out of the gates and uh, we were nominated for a Juno Award for World Music and uh, we won the uh, grand prize in the John Lennon songwriting contest and the uh, world, uh, best world music artist at the Toronto Independent Music Awards. When we come back more from Jaffa Road. Jaffa Road with Aaron Lightstone. Let's see uh. more of you. Okay, Max. How do you create this music? How do you? What's the process of doing this? Well, um, we all have different musical interests and musical backgrounds, but also some uh, com a lot of common ground in our musical interests and, and musical backgrounds. Uh, so, for example, uh, our saxophone player and our bass player have quite a bit of experience in both jazz and Indian music. I've studied some Indian music. I've studied a little bit of jazz. So there's that common ground there. And, and you've also lived in Israel? And I've spent a lot of time in Israel. I haven't, haven't lived there, but uh, yeah, been back and forth and some extended visits. Um, same with Aviva. She spent many summers there uh, during her childhood as her grandparents lived, uh, lived there at the time. So it, we, so we have this uh, interest in these some, sometimes seemingly divergent uh, types of music. And Many of, in many of the instances, I've started a composition, uh, get, you know, get it sort of rolling and uh, create some kind of a rough demo of it. And then everybody has their input and gets their hands on it and it becomes a real collaborative process so that the music is sort of filtered through these five uh, different it's brains with all these different interests. It's hard to believe that you can come to something concrete like a piece of music 
Yeah, it, with five people's hands and ideas in yeah, it. Yeah, and sometimes it's more than less, you know, and sometimes it's more this this one and that one, and the others are a little bit more peripheral. And in the, the, a couple pieces on this album in particular, though, they were real, really the five of us really uh, contributing. You know, there was an example where um, Sundar came up with, uh, or it started with Jeff, he came up with a really interesting groove in a five beat. Uh, rhythmic cycle, and uh, he, he so he recorded it, gave it to us. Sundar came up with a melody that lent itself to that rhythm. Aviva then came up with um, some lyrics uh, for that, and then worked with a collab uh, another collaborator to translate them into French, so that that song is in French and in Hebrew. So and then and so on and so forth. And it just so sort your, of keeps music morphing and building. Is an example of fusion of different countries, different styles. I have trouble with that. I think you lose the original element. It gets lost and forgotten. Yeah, that's, I think that's a fair criticism of, of uh, fusion music. However, um, it only, I, think it, I don't think it's anything new. I, don't, I think it's something that just maybe happens at a, at a quicker pace now that we're in the, the digital internet age. And you know, with, at the click of a mouse, I could literally sit at my computer and spend hours immersing myself in obscure, some obscure musical genre from Iran or Morocco or southern India or wherever. Where, you know, even just 20 years ago, I would have had to have traveled there and really spent time there to get that, to even just hear it. You know? And now, I, now it's all there. So in, that, in, in, in this other sense, though, you know, the, the stories of the Silk Road are are very ancient, where you know, uh, merchants and musicians traveling from, from the Middle East to, to Iran, to India, to East Africa, and, and sharing ideas and cultural cross-fertilization, cross-pollination. So fusion happened It absolutely happened. a thousand years ago. It absolutely happened. I mean, just look at, you can look at, um, you know, you look at India, classical music from India, and you look at classical music from from Iraq, and you look at classical music from the Arab world, and, and they're all, they all have really interesting similarities, and they all, but they also have unique aspects to themselves. And then Iran, sort of in the middle there between India and Iraq, their traditional music borrows elements from both. You know what I mean? So it's clearly that uh, despite these uh, geographical distances, they were all always influencing each other, and that it just happened at a, a much slower slower pace. And I think what I think I would argue that what we're doing now is creating a new kind of traditional music. You know, like if we were to if if a if a musicologist fifty or a hundred years ago uh, would look back at Toronto in in uh, the early part of the twenty first century, I, you know, I hope they would might they might look at the music that Jaff wrote and similar groups are making and say, well that was the traditional or the <laughs> folk music of 21st You're starting century, a tradition. 21st century North America. Yeah, we are, but we're not. I mean, because this kind of uh, thing has been going on for a long time. I think musicians are just inherently uh, interested in music from other cultures and other places when they when they encounter those. And as for the traditional, the the you know the really traditional versions of of these music, you know they're not. Um, they're, as beautiful as those traditional styles are, it's always hard to tell how, how old is that traditional style really, you know, because recording technology only goes back 100 years. When it started, um, the music changed to adapt to, um, to the limits of the technology. Like Louis Armstrong on, on early 78s, well, those had to be two and a half minutes. But live, he would never play a piece that that short because of the importance of improvisation. So that you know, so we don't really know what the time what, elements. What what traditional how you know how quickly the traditional music changes, except that we do know that that uh, they don't remain static. They're always evolving, they're always changing. Okay, we have always... to go for a break. Okay. And we'll come back after this. Okay.
Okay. It's hard to break into this. I'm just mesmerized. Good. Thank you. <laughs> what language was she speaking in? That last Singing. one. That last one is uh, a Ladino song. Oh, I thought so. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. And there's a there's a different there's a uh, I'm very proud of the Ladino song that uh, on that's this? on the on the new one because as far as we know, the first and last time that Avre Los Ojos, the song that's on there, was recorded was in 19. 07, in Turkey on Edison wax cylinders, uh, and it's an early protest song singing about the pain that parents experience when their children are uh, called up for conscription into the armies of the Ottoman Empire. So it's a very interesting song because you know it's sung in this Jewish dialect of Spanish, Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, but it was recorded in in Turkey by a, by a great singer uh, and kanun player in Khazan named Chaim Efendi. And uh, it's a beautiful melody. And uh, it's, you know, it's, got, it's got very powerful lyrics. And uh, Who likes your music, Aaron? Who listens and where does the music take you? Um, well, we have, we have a pretty diverse uh, audience from as far as we can tell when we you know, look out and when the lights aren't too bright and we can see who's in the audience when we're on stage. Um, it's a pretty wide age range, I would say, from you know 30s to 80s. There was an 80-year-old woman who celebrated her birthday at our hmm. last CD release concert, I recall. So in age, it's very wide, and we've uh, we've had the privilege and opportunity to travel all across uh, Canada in the jazz and folk festivals and just general music festivals. Um, such that uh, our audience seems to be people that are, people that are interested in fusion music, people that are interested in, in jazz and music that is has improvised. Is it a particular improvised. ethnic group? Um, no, I mean, well, there's obviously natural appeal with the with the Jewish community because we're singing in Hebrew and, and Ladino and now a little bit in Arabic and French and English. Um, and there's definitely a lot of Jewish references and content in the music. But we think this music really appeals to anybody who is interested in uh, World music, You've folk gone music, to jazz. Newfoundland with this. Well, we've traveled. We've been lucky to tour all across Canada at, at a number of the jazz festivals. But probably the most interesting place that we've been to is in summer of 2010. We we were playing at two music festivals in Nunavut, in the Eastern Canadian Arctic, in communities that are primarily in Inuit. Uh, what population. What's the response? Uh, as far as I can tell, they, they liked it. it. When we played in Chalowit, they've they've got a wonderful music festival there called Alianat, and they've had world music bands before. And then they we went further to a place called Iglulik, which is a very remote community um, north of the Arctic Circle, and it was their first edition of that music festival. And we were one of two bands to play there from from what they call the South, and the rest of the were ours from Nunavut and. As far as we could tell, people people were into it. They'd never really heard anything quite quite like what, what we're doing. Um, we got to play also in in Haida Gwaii in the Queen Charlotte Islands. And this past summer, we were traveling all over British Columbia, including uh, the Belakula Valley in the town of little small little place called Belakula. And uh, in these places, just people people come out who are interested in in all kinds of music. It's uh, astonishing that it would have such wide appeal. I mean, Inuit and, and plain Canadians from 10 generations back. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's music. And, and I think as lo for people that don't mind hearing music that's not in their own language, and some people aren't into that. Some people definitely need to hear music that's in with lyrics of the language they understand for sure, but a lot, a lot of people just hear foreign lyrics as another musical sound in the, in the musical whole, you know? You're launching this CD October 28th, is That's that right. correct? Yeah. October 28th at Hugh's Room, what time? 8.30, the concert will start at 8.30. Uh, people are encouraged to make dinner reservations for, for before the concert to ensure uh, the best seats in the house. It's a small place, but Hughes Room is known in the music community in Toronto for really, although it's a restaurant, for really taking music seriously so that the, the, the dinner and I the service is done before 
by the time the concert starts, you can hear a pin drop in that place. I've it's been there, and I was astonished play. that so many people are rediscovering what I would call folk music. You're calling it world music, but music of the world's people. Mm -hmm. is, is, is that a resurgence of what's going on in the music world, that kind of bringing together? Well, I think, yes. Maybe that's hope for the world that this yes, is happening. Yes, and I think... I think when we say that, when we use the term folk music, I think in general what, what is meant by that term is becoming much broader. Uh, you know, there was a time, maybe when the first folk, festi folk music festivals in Canada were started, that folk music meant, you know, what you heard, uh, you know, the kind of things like Woody Guthrie and, and Bob Dylan playing at the beginning of his career, you know, a singer-songwriter with a guitar. Uh, and there's still some great music like that happening at the folk music festivals. but. I think what that means, that what that, the way that term is used has become much broader. Yeah, music of the world's people. And, and where uh, better than in Canada, where we have more people from all over the world than any place in the world. And I think it's hopeful. If you can do that in music, maybe we can do that in life. We hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Till next time, remember, be a mensch.